Hey everyone, welcome back to the Beat Your Genes podcast. This episode is number 324. It's our second episode of the year, but it's also our second episode on YouTube. And I just want to say I really appreciate all of the support that all of you have given us, the likes, the comments, the text messages that I've received. I really appreciate everybody uh, really enjoying the, the video format. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please hit like, share, and subscribe. It really helps out our channel a ton. And if you're a new listener, if you heard something you liked last episode, and maybe you want to listen to older episodes, you can hear them on any major podcasting platform like Spotify, iTunes, Libsyn, or really any other one. You can also visit beatyourgenes.org and look at uh, listen to episodes on the website as well. I will continue to upload the audio files on those platforms in addition to the video podcast, but eventually we are going to move more on video. I'll also, over the next few weeks, I'll also be uploading a few clips from older episodes as well. So if you hear them and like them, don't forget to share. In today's show, Dr. Lyle answers a question about a mother who wants to go back to work but has heard that this might be bad for the mental health of her children. And our second question is from an adult child who feels upset and betrayed by their parents. So let's see what Dr. Lyle has to say about all of this. All right. So... Yeah, what's been new, Dr. Lyle? How, how, how have you been doing? What's been going on? Uh, not too much. I just uh, Well, I just went to, uh, to France to talk to some young, very smart, high-tech people. And they just had a bunch of questions about different things. So I uh, spent about a week there. And that was uh, good. But uh, it's all, also there's, there's uh, no, no relief like getting back on American soil, you know. Yeah, hopefully that will all, I'll always have that feeling. The, uh, yeah, but I cer certainly do now. There's a, it's a nice feeling to put away your passport and know you're home. So good to be back. In, in the great sage words of, uh, was it Dorothy from Wizard of Oz? There's no place like home. You got it. Absolutely. You bet. <laughs> all right. All well, right. yeah, tell me what's up. Yeah, let's let's get to some questions. Enough of the small talk. So yeah, hold on. Now uh, we want we want to let people know Jen's not with us today. She's uh, you know her her dog Mo died, so now she's had mm -hmm. her both her big uh, companions for the last fifteen years of her life. Both of them have passed in the last month, and they were both you know they were both about the same age, and they're both you know old, quite older dogs and very very sweet, and so. I knew that this was going to someday, you know, when you love something that much, someday you have to pay the price. And, and uh, so Jen's kind of go, going through it this month, but she'll be back in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And we send her our best witches. I actually didn't know that that happened. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. That's a very, very sweet dog. I got to live with him, you know, for a few months uh, when we were over in Hawaii a few years back and just, you know, just a, just a, a dream dog. So yeah. I'm glad I got to know him. Yeah. Well, we wish uh, Dr. Hawk all the best in uh, in this time tough time. You bet. All yeah. right. All right. Let's uh, move on and see what's up and see uh, see what interesting questions we've got. Yeah. Our first question is is uh, so uh, I'm going to take a guess as to what the topic is, and then when you're done answering it, just see how how wrong I was or if I got it, it you know, if I got any anywhere close. So, sure. uh, I'm going to read the question first, and then give give a guess, and then and then uh, then you give us the truth, Doctor Lau. Um, so, dear doctors, I'm trying to decide whether to go back to work a year after my second child or to stay home with her until preschool. I've heard you say on the podcast that it doesn't matter who raises your kids which I understand to be a reference to twin studies that show that parents have very little influence on how their children turn out, outcomes being about 80% genetic. So how do you square this with attachment theory and psychologists who say that children need one primary caregiver for the first three years, or they will be beset with anxiety and depression in their teen years? I'm thinking of the book called Being There by Erica Commissar, in which she advocates very strongly for being a stay-at-home mother for the mental health of your children. I'd like to have a third child, but being out of the workplace for six years would really dent our finances and possibly my self-esteem. So, Dr. Lyle, I'm thinking this is somebody who's wanting to feel productive, but reading competing things about, you know, pop psychology or popular information about being a stay-at-home mom and whether that'll improve the mental health of her kids. Right. So, uh, and were you going to take a guess at what I was going to say? 
<laughs> I have a I have a sneaky suspicion. Yeah. Well, this will not bode favorably for conventional psychologists. Yeah, conventional psychology is ridiculous, and this is all. Um, it's it's hard to believe that anybody actually believes that at this stage of of the game today, uh, given the the strength of the evidence. But you know, it's uh, it, it's kind of like you know, there there's going to be there's going to be nutrition doctors that are going to make a lot of money by telling people how important it is that they get all these different nutrients. Uh, you know, it's the same same thing. In other words, it, it plays so well on human psychology. Uh, the notion of deficiency being this disaster. And so in this case, it's the deficiency of having your mother around. You're, you're going to be permanently crippled for life. It's like you were protein deficient uh, only in a psychological way, and therefore you're a cripple mentally. It's like it's absolutely ridiculous. There's absolutely zero truth in it. This is a, uh, this was, you know, this kind of thing was dreamed up by Sigmund Freud trying to figure out why, you know, I mean, Freud was a charlatan in 17 different ways, but uh, but it, it, I think a lot of the time he was trying really hard. Uh, he was making up theories out of whole cloth. He was borrowing stuff from other other theorists in biology and trying to transplant them, plant them onto his own cockamamie thinking. Uh, but but at the end of the day, what he did do, along with a lot of other people, was basically promulgate the notion that that you are extremely delicate little flower as an infant, which of course you are physically for God's sakes, you know, your, your chances of death until you're quite an old person, you know, the, the most risky year of your life is the first one. Uh, that's because as a human being, you're born years prematurely relative to other animals. And so you've got to have parents around, you have to have interested parties around in order to save, see to it that you don't get walked off by a wolf. And so the um, so that it, it's not a far cry, you know, it's it's very close to human psychology to be thinking, oh my God, my kid's vulnerable as hell that first year or so. And so as a parent, I I would be nervous about leaving my kid, you know, at daycare a year or one or two, not because of their psychological issues, but because of their physical ones. In other words, you know, do, do we really want some $18 an hour employee being the individual that's carting my kid around? And then, you know, how do we know what drugs that girl's been on and how, how much sleep she's missed and whether or not she's going to, you know, stumble around and trip over something and drop my kid drop on my on its head? It's like, that's what I would be worried about. So if you're going to be worried about anything, that's what you should be worried about. But for God's sakes, don't worry about your kid's psychological development. That's a that's a legacy of Sigmund Freud's, you know, crazy, ignorant nonsense. And it and it will perpetuate itself in, you know, all kinds of different ways into the present. And uh, there's no truth in it at all. So your kid is designed by nature to survive and reproduce. It is not some, you know, it has a innate period of high vulnerability physically physically high vulnerability okay not psychologically it's not vulnerable psychologically at all the fact that it may squall is because it's vulnerable physically that's the reason okay so uh it certainly has an edgy volatile uh emotional life because it needs to be signaling to adults that it could be in trouble and it needs all kinds of help okay so it wants to make damn sure it can it can make a blood curdling scream that will get you to drop everything and go serve its interests. So, but the fact that it may have some volatility in its in its emotional life, which it will, as as a young in entity, does not mean that it is psychologically vulnerable to some kind of informational assault of abandonment or any other, you know, nonsense. No. It's designed by nature to see to it that it doesn't get abandoned and scream bloody murder in case it is. If it turns out that its mother dies because its mother gets eaten by a, an African lion, which would have happened plenty, or got, gotten you know grabbed by a big anaconda down at the river or a crocodile, hey, that happened all the time. So the bottom line is, what happens then? You get raised by your aunt, for God's sakes, okay? 
The kid doesn't miss a beat. It's not designed by nature to be so fragile psychologically that it can't take a new caretaker. All it needs is to be able to survive physically. That's its needs. So anybody that is pushing the notion that a kid needs a primary caretaker for the first three years to you know, attach, i.e. attachment theory, hell no, none of that's true. Okay, so that, that is just wholesale made up. And you know, a lot of bright people uh, were thinking deeply about this, not very intelligently, but they were thinking deeply about this and they were, they were trying to aim at the truth. John Bowlby, Mary Ainsworth, these are some giants in the field of early 20th century and mid 20th century developmental psychology. Along with them came a bunch of psychodynamic people with you know, all kinds of completely cockamamie theories, none of them based in anything in fact. So this is pure garbage, okay? And uh, it, it's, it's not just twin studies, it's adoption studies. So the, uh, all, all you need to do is look at, if you want to know the truth for your own soul, because you're actually afraid and you don't fully trust me, I don't want you to trust me. Go buy the book Blueprint by Robert Plowman and start on page one. <laughs> okay? And by the time you read your way through Blueprint, you will not probably, unless you have a Degree, undergraduate degree in biology or genetics, you're not going to understand the last part of the book. You don't need to, okay? Read the first 100 pages of Blueprint. By the time you have read the first 100 pages of Blueprint, uh, any sane individual will have, you know, it, it's like reading the first 100 pages of the McDougall plan 40 years ago. It's like, okay, enough, okay? You've now assaulted me with so much data that there's nowhere to hide from the truth. Well, there's nowhere to hide from the truth that your, your uh, children and yourselves are extremely robust to uh, all kinds of turbulence in your environment. In other words, you're, you're designed by nature to be reactive to it and to learn from it and to try to you know, not have bad traumatic things repeat, but it's not damaging to you. Uh, and it's not damaging to have your mother you know, eaten by a wolf and now you're raised by her sister or you know, et cetera, that's just fine. You don't have a problem with that. You'll never remember your mother, for God's sakes, okay? It won't, won't have any meaning to you at all, okay? The only thing that will mean anything to you is how valuable you appear to be whoever it is that's raising you. And if they seem irritated and treat you with like a third-class citizen, because after all, you're a third cousin, uh, then you're going to feel that. But it, it, you know, but that changes, in other words, that just makes you a more careful citizen and not trying to take more than your share of the berry pie, you know what I mean, at Thanksgiving. In other words, you'll pick up the cues that, hey, I'm kind of a second class citizen here because I'm not a first or second degree relative to these people. That's fine. Okay, so that isn't gonna hurt you any. It just puts you, doesn't scar you at all. Uh, pe people are deeply mistaken about psychological pain. Uh, they believe that psychological pain somehow scars you. It does not scar you. It's unpleasant. Okay. Uh, if you if you break your finger, you are not scarred. I've, I've broken many fingers, and they're all fine. Nothing's in any pain now. They're in perfectly good function. Uh, but at the time, like it hurts, and it's designed to hurt to weave your way around a vulnerability at the time when you're compromised. The same thing is true if you're not a very welcome child in a situation whether you're a first degree biological or not. There's first three, three biological children that are not particularly welcome and they don't get along particularly well with their parents. And their parents are you know, selfish, self-absorbed people that really didn't have any business having children. And so it's unpleasant, okay? It doesn't scar you. The, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that as you become an adult, you, nothing about that has made it so that you are needy, anxious, vulnerable, socially awkward, nothing. Okay, if you're sort of the self-interested, me first kind of a person that can't get along with other people, guess what? It's not because you were deprived as a child. <laughs> we know why. Now I feel better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I've had many people come up to me once they've heard me explain things to them and, and say, wow, you know, I was molested as a kid. And now that I understand how this works, I'm relieved because I've always kind of wondered if it caused some damage to me, even though. I couldn't place my finger on any sort of damage or any sort of disturbance, but people make such a big deal about it in the press that I, I've wondered if I've 
had some compromise in my life that I didn't really know about. And now that you've explained it to me, it's like, oh, I can let it go. It's like, yeah, I don't have to worry about it. It's not an open loop. So yeah, trauma, substitute the word trauma for learning experience, uh, substitute uh, the, the idea of lack of the deep attachment with, hey, you, you need a caretaker to survive. The, the uh, uh, apparently, in some extraordinary deprived circumstances in the early 20th century, somewhere in Poland, I, I can't remember what it was, that they, they uh, if a, a baby is not touched for, you know, six months or some damn thing, but is fed just enough that apparently that these children wound up with some psychological, you know, oddities. It's like, yeah, maybe, or maybe they weren't touched because they already had psychological oddities. So, the, uh, which is well known that, that when children have oddball psychological characteristics, they are not particularly attractive and they don't elicit loving responses out of people around them. So the, the studies from the early 20th century that reported this horrific result of, of maternal or loving deprivation in children, totally flawed, okay? So we have no idea, nobody will ever know. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe somewhere we're going to find some horrific group of people that took a bunch of completely normal people and stole them from somewhere, you know, from from normal parents and then put them under some draconian, you know, uh, crime against humanity developmental program to see what the hell would happen. In other words, maybe. Okay? So my guess is we'll never know and we never need to know. The, the, the truth of the matter is children uh, often lost their parents and wound up with surrogates that might not have been nearly as loving, but were loving enough. And in that way, they became a, a big, basically adopted children, usually by a second or third degree relative. And there was enough love there and enough genetic interest that, uh, that they grew up fine. And so that, that's why you don't find un, unusually developmentally odd personality characteristics coming out of adopted children. You just don't find it. Okay, so... You don't find it because the, uh, not, there's no trauma as a result of your parent giving you up and then winding up in foster care for two, three years until you get adopted. It's like, you know, like I said, not pleasant, but quite frankly, you'll never remember it. You know, uh, many of us have had some you know, unpleasant things happen and we've completely forgotten them and, until we start excavating around you know, and then I can remember like, oh, yeah, that was such a good thing. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, your your memories are basically like a library. They are they're books in the library. They just sit there. They don't do anything. And only when you go looking for them do you open them up. So I've, I've watched all kinds of movies. And if you were to talk to me about them, I'd be like, oh, that's right. I remember. OK, but the, the fact that 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 information sits in a library doesn't doesn't mean that it's an active little termite like the, like the fact that I saw alien and then I saw aliens and then I saw aliens two or whatever the hell aliens three okay uh, I can remember all those things and I can start to get a lot of anxiety and it's creepy as shit okay but that doesn't mean there's little alien creepy shit operating inside my nervous system all the time at some low level that I don't know exists no. Those things are filed away in a book that only gets open when the environmental circumstances are, are basically shouting a warning because I'm looking for the book. So if you've had a substantial loss in your past, that, that thing gets filed away, okay? It doesn't get repressed. It isn't that it's so painful. Like this, this Freudian notion that it's so painful that you can't remember. It. It's like that has... 180 degree upside down ass backwards completely illogical has makes no sense at all at all in terms of biology why have a memory at all if you can't use it if, if it's if it's destructive to the organism don't have it at all okay the fact that you uh that people think they quote repress the memories because they can't access them easily that's because there's such a dusty old book that of no utility it's a hard time finding it in the library it's such a low priority but you go to some, you know, rinky-dink psych psychologist or psychiatrist or therapist that thinks that it's super, super important because they've been miseducated. 
And they go digging around and digging around and digging around. Well, if you dig and dig and dig and dig and dig, guess what? You can find it, maybe. If it, if it, it, was, if it was traumatic, it's probably got a file in there. And so you can finally shine enough light on it and dust the book off. And but guess what? Open it up and you can have some feelings. Just like I can have some feelings if I open up Gone with the Wind and read a few pages. Okay, so the um, so just because that's true doesn't mean those feelings have been buried. They're not buried, they're deactivated. Okay. Your your job in life is to have feelings that are reacting to your environmental circumstances in order to orient you towards what's in your best interest for survival and reproductive success, period, end of subject, okay? So if you've had unpleasant feelings in the past, they are filed away with a very sophisticated somatic network that it's designed by nature to be quiet until it's needed. And then when it's needed, believe me, you need it, i.e., here's a handbook of engineering disasters, okay? In, in bridge building in Switzerland in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. You think that might be a valuable book? You're damn straight it would be a valuable book. Okay, so, you know, are people thinking about it? No, but if you start building a bridge somewhere around Mont Blanc, and, you know, you're gonna blast a bunch of dynamite, you know, you, it might be wise for you to open up the book on engineering disas disasters, you know, around Mont Blanc, you know, in its history. Why? Because maybe there's something about the geology of the situation that you need to know, okay? And that's exactly how traumatic processes work, and that's exactly, you know, I don't know, this is a long, long, far afield, but it's it's a very, very close uh, cousin and associated cousin of the notion of, of uh, childhood attachment and lack thereof being a trauma, okay? It's not a freaking trauma. So uh, you don't you don't need this attachment that everybody thinks you need. It's all bogus, and you can determine very very clearly that uh, your as Robert Plumman says over and over again, super beautifully and well. Parenting is important, but it doesn't matter. Education is important, but it doesn't matter. What does he mean by that? It's important for the processes that are in front of you. Okay, so uh, the first three years of life, do you have you know, somebody that cares about you and loves you, or are you freaking an orphan? Does it matter? Uh, uh, it doesn't matter in the long run, but it matters in the short run, i.e., that's why it's important. It's important that that little kid, you know, is sad and lonely and anxious. Yes. Will it make him sad and lonely and anxious in the future? Absolutely not. Okay. If you've ever been somewhere cold, you know, I can remember being in Moscow, Idaho, uh, going to school and going down and staring, you know, at the end of the street, you know, waiting for spring. I would stare at the, the bank and the banks would have a, uh, there's a, would have the, the digital thermometer. I'd go down there and it'd be like 14 degrees. I'm like, come on. It's a Southern California kid, you know, crazily went up to the University of Idaho and I'm like, Come on, 14 degrees. I'd stare at that, okay? I can remember that, like big old down coat I brought up there that I was so happy to have. Like I'm gonna be up in the North like John Denver. You know, I'm going up to the up to the snow. It's like, man, by, by February 10th, I'm like, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> and I'd go down there just about every night, walk down the little hill where I lived and, Go down and stare at that thing, 16 degrees. <laughs> okay. Am I cold now? No. I am not cold now. Am I traumatized? No. I was informed. I had a romanticized version of what the snow and a winter was going to be like in the north. And then I lived through one and it's like, okay, <laughs> got it. <laughs> you just came back from the snow, I understand, right? What's that? I you just, just came back, back from the snow. snow. Way nicer than Moscow, Idaho. <laughs> way, way warmer and way nicer. Yeah, Moscow, Idaho was like Moscow, Russia. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> All right. The Dr. Lau, the <clears throat> one of the first things that comes to my mind when I hear that kids have trauma is the trauma that they experience when they're learning how to walk and they're falling down constantly. Yeah. And so I'm thinking if, if it were true that that somehow this type of trauma 
prevents them from acting then or prevents them from doing anything then they shouldn't be desiring to walk at all after a few a few falls well said uh, i never had anybody put it quite like that so yeah you keep falling and it keeps hurting and you keep falling and it keeps hurting and it's like hey you know so, such is life the uh that that happens to be the the, the human process of learning to walk it's not the process of the horse that horse doesn't go through that they can't afford that process so the uh they have to get get up and be able to run in half an hour or something like this so yeah uh, the, the the notions of humans and attachments and the how how you know how very gentle it is and oh my god a little terrible thing happened and therefore it scars my child's you know nervous system for life and now they're going to be five percent less naturally confident than they otherwise would have been turns out to be nonsense it it wasn't crazy it was just a wild hypothesis, but it turns out it's a wild hypothesis that got incredible attention from all quarters by, you know, by and, and prop, propagated by mass human ignorance, as well as some legitimate treasonous behavior on the part of spokespeople. So whoever this is that wrote this fancy book recently about how, what a big deal this is, this is nothing new. We, we could go back in the entire century of the 20th century and have one psychodynamic thinker after the next same thing. Okay, so the uh, and, and all of it, all of it's BS. All you have to do is open plumbing, find out the truth, and we're done. So if you want to go back to work, fine. Just make sure that whoever's watching your kid doesn't drop it. That's the big concern. Now, Dr. Lyle, now before so your kid, your kid is way safer in year one to year two than it is from zero to one. And it is massively safer from year two to year three than it is from year one to year two. The first two years of life are easily but the, the riskiest years. It's not even close. Uh, so by the time your your child uh, reaches their what their second birthday, um, yeah, two years, two years in, that's that's a pretty tough little monkey at that point. And uh, three years is real tough. So. But uh, two years, pretty sturdy little animal. And uh, but year one to year two, me personally, if I could afford it, I'd stay home and have a mom. You know, I'd have somebody highly invested watching that child to just make sure that we get through that that year. That's that would be my thinking. Now, Dr. Lyle, so uh, Robert Pullman wrote his book, The Blueprint. Uh, or blueprint yeah. uh, a few years ago and yeah. it, it sounds like you've had a suspicion about many of these things even before that book came out uh in your yeah. in your psychology practice um, can you share with us some of the some of what you believed before you read blueprint um i would say i uh, but the uh, the concepts in blueprint were new to me. in other words these concepts have been uh these discoveries were were first came to the attention of academic psychology in the in the middle 1980s so this is this is where the first big databases the first big uh, uh investigations were coming out of the university of minnesota and it was like okay now now we can pretty well dispense with all previous theorizing about the, the nature of personality um you know there's this movie that was made uh identical strangers or something like this about the three triplets there were identical triplets, I guess, uh, extremely rare case, and and they were secretly uh, separated out from birth and then put into these different families uh, at the direction of a psychodynamically oriented uh, psychiatrist. I forget who the guy's name is, a real famous dude in, in America's uh, psychodynamic circles. I never heard of the guy, Bruno Bettelheim, or whoever the hell it is that he was. These are not important figures in my life. They may be very important figures in the history of psychoanalysis, but they're not important figures in the legitimate science of scientific investigation of psychology. So therefore they never made it into my my thinking. But when I read I went to to, to see the uh the movie, it was kind of a remarkable movie looking at these three guys who are incredibly similar. Uh, and they've grown up together, but what they did was they it's kind of an interesting movie. In, for, in a lot of ways, uh, many things interesting about the movie, but they put at the direction of the psychiatrist, this agency, put these three children in very different homes with very different parents, in thinking that the attachment style 
of the child with the parent was going to, it was going to be basically, it was a rare opportunity for dumb, dumb psychiatry, psychodynamic psychiatrists to think he was going to do science to, to really show the grand theory of Freudian and Freudian masters about how important the nature of the parenting would be on the outcome of these three kids. I mean, this is what they did. And I mean, it was, yeah, I don't know. They're, they've been vilified for it, like it was some terrible thing to you know separate these children out. It wasn't oh, a terrible right. thing to separate these children out. If anybody wanted all three of them, then I don't know, maybe you give them to those per people. It's just it's legitimate to let them go each to the wind and each be adopted into one home. Like, hey, it's enough to adopt one child. You know, you really think you want to take on three? Anybody who thinks they want to take on three adopted triplets. You know, I'm not so sure how mentally stable though those individuals are. So it it was not a draconian, terrible thing to do to separate these three children out. Uh, and so they, this is what they did. It, it was uh, folly to try to choose the cold parent, the warmer parent, and then the one that was in the middle. OK, this is what they did, thinking that the parenting style was going to be all important in the developmental you know, psychology of these individuals. And this was going to be the great Freudian proof of this. Well, it turns out it's all bullshit. There, there, there's no reason for us to even look at this. But the people that made the film ironically bought into it. Like, how, how hilarious is that? They're like looking through the, the lens of these kids. You know, one of them, I think, commits suicide. Like, so uh, they're, they're thinking that this has something to do with the coldest of the parenting or whatever, like they don't understand it. I mean, ironically, the people that do the film on identical triplets, you know, they're criticizing the psychodynamic people who made it into a study as if that's what caused the instability in the personalities. Uh, like all everybody that had anything to do with that film missed the boat, including the two remaining brothers who were like bitching about how they were kind of mistreated and treated like animals because they were in a study. Yeah, you're treated beautifully by the world. You're on freaking Johnny Carson or whatever the hell it is as you become this story. You know, you have a fancy restaurant that you try to run and everybody thinks you're cool and fascinating. It's like, that's bullshit. Like this, this is, uh, the, the, we, we look at now through the lens of Robert Plumman. And Robert Plumman, you know, at, and all of the evidence starting about 1985 is saying, hey, you know, no, the parenting isn't making any difference. Doesn't matter how they're parented. Like that's not going to influence the personality that you're going to see at 25 years old. The um, the parenting will matter, uh, at, at, as Plumlin would say, it's important, i.e., what was the child's experience growing up? Did it enjoy itself or was it, a, you know, a, a, a nightmare? Well, that matters. In this case, none of these those three kids had a nightmare. They had different experiences based on three perfectly reasonable sets of parents. Okay, and so, uh, uh, so when we see differences in adjustment of the three kids later, that that has to do with the fact that all three of them have a narcissistic streak, highly extroverted, got some instability, and uh, and it turns out that you know proclivity for using drugs and alcohol. And, and one of them wound up in enough, you know, sort of, you know, trouble that uh, he checked out. It's like, OK, that the uh, that that isn't because of his bad parenting when he was like four years old. That's because at 44 years old, he got himself into financial trouble, wasn't pulling his weight, was, you know, self-indulgent dude. And well, I'm checking out. Fair enough. You know, he had, had some inherent instability in there. So anyway, the. Um, yeah, I, I certainly was aware of this evidence, and I, I wasn't aware of it when I went to grad school. When I went to grad school, it hadn't been published yet. And so um, I, I, as when I went to grad school, I was stunned to learn about, uh, about behavior genetics. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I assumed that we all just sort of, I don't know, became ourselves through our learning experience. I, I remember listening to some you know english teachers say well you know we are the sum total of our experiences and i'm thinking yeah i mean what else could it be i didn't have any idea N neither neither did my professors of experimental social psychology at the university of virginia when when uh 
when the behavior genetics information came in and started massively encroaching on theories of personality, everybody was defensive. Everybody felt their turf was being carved up and swallowed by a monster. And not only that, a Nazi-like monster. Okay, so the uh, one that was talking about genetics, the way the Nazis talked about genetics and better genes and worse genes and smarter genes and dumber genes and more impulsive genes and more conscientious genes. It's like, oh, that sounded pretty bad. That sounded very uh, Nazi fascist. And, uh, and so the people that were willing to even talk about those things, they were considered to be you know, difficult and disagreeable and suspicious in terms of their of their characters. I mean, that was the aura it, you know, in the 1980s as this information is starting to come out and at the very, very elite, elite level in academia starting to cause a tectonic plate crisis. And uh, so a few years later, when I'm graduating and I'm teaching at Stanford and I'm part of a little social personality group and there wasn't a behavior geneticist in there. There wasn't, you know, I don't believe there was not a behavior genetics um, sympathetic or behavior genetics uh, researcher at the at Stanford University at that time in in social personality. So it was absolutely dominated by uh, by classic one of the mill learning theory all the way down, and so the I mean there were people in that department that weren't talking behavior genetics, but were EP, you know, Roger Shepard. And, and then under him, uh, Jeffrey Miller was wandering around the department and, and I, I walked past him 50 times and never knew who the hell he was, just a grad student. But, um, but the point is, is that and Anne Fernald was there. And so there was EP's knowledgeable people there, but I don't recall anybody there. Uh, other, I remember Jack Hilgard, one of the grand old men of psychology, uh, basically very defensive, and Albert Bandura, very defensive about behavior genetics. This is 1992, and they are, uh, they are not wanting any part of this. They are, they are, you're, you know, Jack Hilgard was a nice guy, but he was, you know, gonna, gonna poo-poo it, and, um, and Albert Bandura was hostile. Uh, Al Albert Bandura didn't want any, uh, didn't want a sound of this. He didn't like any, any part of it, and, uh, and certainly Phil Zimbardo and, and these guys, uh, they, they were, uh, Lee Ross, they, they, they had been so deeply steeped and educated in social learning theory and social psychology, which are different things. But the notion that people are interchangeable units. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess there's something it's weird from a competitive the standpoint, too. It's like, you can just be replaced instead of wanting to have your kids run the business. <laughs> you know, you know, Nathan, it's, um, this, this is one of these really interesting, um, really interesting things in, in history and in human nature that it can be so intimidating to think outside of the group norms that that people will stare at evidence that is absolutely a hundred percent contrary to uh to what it is that their theory is and not blink and this is one of those times the um so the uh, there there are other examples i could give right now that would be controversial and i and i then i want to bring it into this podcast uh, there's a different time and place for it there there are concepts in the world that are so absolutely contrary to the truth that it is astounding that human beings are staring right at them and they they are they are effectively so trying in their thinking that they cannot think their way out of it behavior genetics is one of those things uh behavior genetics is is um one of the greatest and most important discoveries in world history the, uh, it, it is amazing how, what an extraordinary um, tidal wave of, of, of opposition there is to behavior genetics. The P people don't want to look at it, don't want to follow it down, don't want to follow the implications of it. They are, they are terrified, I believe, 
at a tribal level of being labeled as an outgroup and a, you know, essentially a bad human. So they can't discuss it openly and they won't. And so, but the truth of the matter is, it's all around us. It's staring us right in the face. Like, like uh, uh, eugenics is staring us right in the face. Every time you choose to go out on a date or not go out on a date, you're you're practicing eugenics. Like, what the hell else do you think you're doing? <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's all you're doing. Yeah. Who do I think has the best genes? Is it good enough? Is it a good deal for me? You know, this is what you're doing. You're you're attempting to. You know, your your preferences are nothing other than bubbling out of your adapted mind and they are practicing eugenics. Like, no, we're not taking those genes on. We're taking these genes on if we can. And that's what everybody's doing, obviously. And to to stare at this and try to jump up and down and say people are interchangeable units, it's like obviously ridiculous. And so the uh, I think I had somebody write to me um, in the last five years, some very thoughtful young, uh, uh, you know, uh, young guy. I, I believe I remember who this is. Who was is going to be a psychologist, and he uh, he said something that I, I don't recall anybody else. I, I don't recall ever having read it anywhere else. And uh, but I, I'm I'm stealing it because it's in my book now. <laughs> so everything that's in our book isn't something that I originally thought. Sometimes I farmed it out. You know. I, Take, take it from anywhere. But uh, unfortunately, the way the book's written is like, I can't give him credit. But um, uh, his comment was, do you think one of the reasons why people do not believe in behavior genetics is because human beings are born so prematurely that they're all extremely similar when they're one year old? Mm. And, it, and it takes several years for it to emerge. And then they misattribute the years in between as being the reason. And I thought... Damn, is that smart. I don't recall anybody in the discussion of behavior genetics ever making that comment. That was a, very, and I believe that the young man has absolutely nailed it square on the head. If we were born the way we are at seven years old, if that's how, you, which would be a very reasonable amount of function for human beings to have, to be about the level of, call it a five-year-old. Okay, so a five-year-old is, you know, a young chimpanzee is, is you, you know, by, by nine weeks, they're probably about as capable as a, as a human fiber. So I'm not, that could be a, some exaggeration, but maybe not too much. A one-year-old chimpanzee is unbelievably capable. So they are an extremely capable little creature. They're small, but they are unbelievable, agile, and quick. They're not going to get eaten by, you know, some other animal. So a one-year-old human is obviously completely helpless. So there is a vast, you know, human beings have a bizarre childhood of an extraordinary length of feebleness as they are tremendous, you know, we sacrifice the, the, the body maturity for a massive mind. And in doing so, you had to have highly invested parents looking over you, trying to make sure that you don't get killed for several years. But let's suppose that, in in 60 days, you would have yourself the equivalent of a five-year-old. That's reasonable, okay? So if we did that, we would see how dramatically different those five-year-olds are. And it would be an easy matter to realize that, no, you know, it didn't really matter what the hell happened the first couple of months. It didn't really make that much difference. Did you live near, near a volcano and almost get killed or, you know, did you almost get carried off by a wolf or was everything pleasant and nice? Or did your dad, you know, die in a campfire accident? It's like right in front of you. Like what the hell happened? And the truth of the matter is we would, we would find out that, Hey, by five years and two months, you, you know, after a couple months on the planet, wow, you're an awful lot different. These nine kids in the village that all were born about the same time, they are dramatically different from each other. Okay, we can we can tell immediately how different they are. Some of them are shy and nervous and anxious, attached, and some of them are securely attached and, and eerily uh, similar to their parents. <laughs> they're eerily similar to their parents, and uh, and and yet they wouldn't be eerily similar if their parents died and they were adopted by somebody else. They would be eerily similar to the parent that died that they never met. So, but 
people wouldn't be able to run those correlation coefficients because almost all the time they'd be raised by the parents. And so th this is, it still breeds the concept of imitation and learning, but you would certainly have, you wouldn't have the deep resistance and puzzlement that you probably do now as a result of basically obscuring the impact of the genes until you watch you watch it emerge and then you can't tell that you, you you know the old nazis used to say oh give me a kid for seven years and i will you know turn him in anything i want no you won't you won't turn him into anything you won't have any influence at all okay so that you know that is uh that has been one of the great mysteries uh, of human life has been the individual differences, the emergence of individual personalities. It's an enormously important question. Um, it has profound implications for clinical psychology because if I've got somebody 35 years old with this whole host of issues, it's like I, I can look at that and I can say, huh, I know what those are. Those are gene variances. And so I, I can't change that in you. There's no possible way we're going to do anything. About it. What can we do? Like, we understand what we can do and what we can't do. And so that that also kind of um, limiting, you know, uh, kind of commentary also rubs people the wrong way. Unfriendly, you know what I mean? Hitlerian, you know, fascist. Like this is, no, you can't, you can't limit my child. I've had some very angry emails uh, written to me over the couple of decades uh, about this. And, uh, and yet I, I'm not, you know, I'm not here pushing a political point. I'm here basically educating people about the evidence. And the strange thing is the evidence is staring you right in the face. Like everybody you know is vastly different than everybody else that you know. The, uh, my, my, my mother is vastly different than my sister. And my sister is vastly different than my father. And my father is very different than his three siblings. It's like, hey, people. People are very individual. They are unique combinations. And uh, you won't see anywhere where all those kids are the same. It's like them. Yeah, you'll, see, you'll see groups and families where you'll see a couple of siblings that are, you know, you've got a couple of similar gametes. You know, they're, they're quite a lot alike. You'll see that. And then you'll see a couple of siblings that are very, very different. And uh, that's just the, the nature of genetics. So... Yeah, great, great question. We'll take another one here just for the heck of it. But this was a, um, yeah, yeah, for me, I don't, I don't enjoy particularly being argumentative and being problematic and contrary. And um, I, uh, I, I don't really care particularly that my colleagues don't know anything. It's like, okay, they don't know. Anything. Well, what are you going to do? So the, uh, I, I don't feel um upset that that, that basically you know hundred thousand American psychologists are going to go to their grave and almost none of them knew anything about personality for God's sakes. Uh it's it's uh you know hundred thousand American doctors are going to go to their grave and they're not going to know how many people they could have saved and what lives they could have changed for the better had they known anything about diet. So you know such as such as life and such as uh, ignorance and and as uh, Max Planck said, you know, science advances one funeral at a time. And, uh, and you know, we, we have the capacity, you know, in we have a great, a great scientist like Frank Plowman who writes a book that for certain of us, you know, there will be many young uh, psychologists in the world that will read a Plowman and they'll read it and then they'll think clearly their whole life. So there'll be more of them in the next generation that think clearly than in the last generation. So you know, 100, 150 years from now, this will be known by everybody. It will be, it will be the, I mean, I could, I could speak that clearly since nobody will ever be able to prove me wrong. The, uh, but it would seem to me very much akin to uh, the origin of species. So when the origin of species came out, it was horrifying the intelligentsia. It was a, it was a land war uh, uh, you know, basically between the creationists and the evolutionists, and they were they fought out a tooth and nail, and continued to fight through George W. Bush's administration with his wanting to put intelligent design in the schools for God's sakes. Okay, so, um, however, we can see that you know, 150 years later, Darwin has won the day. 
So the, the, the truth has seeped its way into every corner. It's seeped its way all the way into the Catholic Church. You know what I mean? It's, you know, people understand that genes cause, you know, that this is sort of how life works. So we are much further ahead in our thinking as a species, you know, 150 years uh, post Darwin. And the same thing will be true 100 years post Darwin. So the, uh, uh, the world will eventually recognize the truth. Uh, Plumman believes it's going to happen much sooner because of the extraordinary research explosion in and the ability to identify the impacts of sweet sweet genes on behavior. It's going to be so good, he believes. It's going to be so precise that it literally can't be denied. Okay, so um, that could be true. He could be wrong. It could be too complicated, and they, they may be able to live in ignorance and obscure the truth for another 50 years. But um, it's a shame uh, when people can't see the truth. It, it is valuable to know the truth. It's valuable to know um, if you're a parent, that if you've got some argumentative, pain in the ass, difficult child, you didn't cause this. This is not a developmental problem. It isn't something that happened four years ago when this or that thing, bad thing happened. There's a big shakedown or a divorce or something. That's not what caused that. that. That's genetics is what you're looking at. And so our job is to simply manage the conflicts of interest that give rise to individual variances in personalities and circumstances. The, uh, we're not, you know, that, that, what we're looking at, that's in there. Okay. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to be a disagreeable pain in the ass. It could be a very useful thing for, for someone to get resources out of the world to protect themselves. So, you know, it may not be pleasant to be its parent, but Hey, that's just the way it is. So, but to be thinking as parents will, because they're you know, miseducated by psychotherapists and everybody else, like this idiot who wrote this attachment thing. But the reason why that's happening is because there's some attachment crisis in the child's development uh, in, in its relationship with his parents. It's just flat out ridiculous. And so it's extremely useful to basically unburden parents, parents of those delusions. That's super useful. So uh, this is one of the most important discoveries in the history of science. And it is one of the least welcome that you're ever going to see. Unfortunately, but hopefully times are changing. Yeah. All right. Give me a quick one. Got, do we got another one? Yep. Yeah. This next one is a, uh, a kid who's upset that parents are spending resources on some other child. Okay. So I want to get your take on this afterwards. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Dear doctors, I grew up in a Christian home, but I stopped going to church once I left home. All of my immediate family are still very religious, and my parents financially support someone who was my best friend in high school, who has now become a missionary. I find that dynamic very unfair, and I recently told both parties that I feel that boundaries have been crossed. My friend asked my parents to stop supporting her but they refused. I feel betrayed by my parents. How do you advise that I deal with the relationship moving forward? I've already ended my friendship, but wish I could be emotionally closer to my parents. Yes. Well, let me give you my first pass. And there's obviously all kinds of uh, background details. Uh, there's it's a more complicated picture that's being written here. But from the sound of it, this person's an adult. If their friend was a missionary, then everybody's like over 20 years older. And um, so <clears throat> my, I'm going to start my answer to the question of um, I remember George Herbert Walker Bush, you know, made his famous pronouncement that then sunk him a year or so later when he said, read my lips, no new taxes. <laughs> 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 okay, you read my lips. Your parents don't owe you anything. Nothing. Okay. So the first place we start this is uh they it's their money, they went and earned it. Okay. Now, if you toiled on the family farm and lived in poverty while they sold the crops and then put that into a stocking for you that they said that it was you and the other kids you're gonna be able to go to school one day. And that's what all your sacrifice was as you worked till 10 o'clock every night and then got up at, at five in the morning and milked cattle. If that's true, then your parents 
have indeed betrayed you. Okay? But I, uh, my crystal ball tells me that's not what happened. My crystal ball tells me that one or both of your parents went to work for years, supported you, put a nice roof over your head, got, you know, you, you got through, you know, uh, they paid their taxes. You managed to have, you know, Converse All-Stars to wear or whatever it is that you wore to school. And uh, you're fine. And they don't owe you a damn thing. Nothing. Okay. So that would be my attitude. So my attitude is, is that their hard work and savings is for them to spend on whatever it is that they want to spend it on, okay? And so how it is that you calculated that you still have some rights to direct that, you know, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I believe that that is a misunderstanding of what would be ethically straight up. Ethically straight up is, is that your parents, you know, are seeking their own happiness with the resources that they have created through their own effort. What, what on earth, you know, are, you know, does it have anything to do with you? So you might say, oh boy, that can make my life a lot better. Why, why support my friend who's a missionary? It's like, that's fine. Uh, you can look at that. You, you could certainly tell them, hey, listen, you know, if you can give her $25,000 a year, I could really use your help. You know, I'm trying to get this or that done. It's fine. You can, you could. You could say that to them so that they you don't suffer in silence, uh, but they could also, you know, and you could let them compute that in their own mind. But from my standpoint, um, uh, that that is what's coming out of there is a, uh, a, a not 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 completely from left field. Uh, in other words, I, I understand that there's a notion that somehow. You know, I'm your the living embodiment of your genes, and therefore you ought to be continuing to sacrifice to your last day, try to aid and abet my cause. Like, I sort of understand that that's half ass embedded in Boston to your nervous system, but I would um, I would say to you, if that's true, then wouldn't it also be reasonable for them to be directing and deciding who it is that you mate with? It's about as reasonable. Okay, so my attitude is, is that uh, be grateful that you had parents that were apparently civil, decent, loving, supportive, and uh, then upon adulthood, uh, they, they basically, you know, have, have their own choices about, you know, now that you're a fully loaf, baked, uh, uh, loaf of bread, it's time for you to move on and take care of yourself. Okay, so um, I don't know anywhere in the animal kingdom that fully grown adult animals are supported by their parents. Doesn't exist. So uh, you don't need that help. And they, they uh, as far as I'm concerned, they, they are completely reasonably free to try to seek their own happiness in whatever way they can. You you are, if they impact you and you can say, hey, listen, I, I, I think that's, uh, I think you're sort of miss analyzing where it is that your resource ought to be going. Fine, you can make your pitch. But um, I, don't, I don't see any angle by which you're entitled to anything. And um, I think that you're best served, uh, maybe uh, may, maybe uh, a reading of Harry Brown's book, How I Found Freedom on End of the World, would be a useful uh, primer in the notion of nobody owes you anything. That's a really good place to to uh, sort of have your your ethical your ethical uh, set point is that that's where that's where things start. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking oh, perhaps God. one <clears throat> perhaps one sliver of why there's not a, as much emotional closeness is because you know it's possible that the parents feel the the expectation that they're supposed to be you know putting their money where they maybe don't want to put it, and so. Maybe this would make them more close if if they signal to their parents that uh, that they don't feel entitled to their to their resources. Yeah, it's interesting that I can't talk somebody into not feeling entitled. Um, mm. Strangely enough, I did that one time. So uh, I I hit an entitled young lady over the head with this argument, and it. It was startling, but I got a, a a letter from her. She went to the trouble of sending me a letter six months to a year later telling me that it, it completely altered her relationship with her parents for the better. 
that she had not considered the idea that they didn't know her anything. It had actually not crossed her mind. And uh, she was, she had simply never had anybody come from such a completely different angle. Uh, and so yeah, I succeeded once. I don't know if I'll ever succeed again. Maybe that was a freak accident with that individual. But certainly, um, you know, nobody owes you anything. That is true. Okay, so get get that get that firmly through your head uh, as a as a truth of the world. And you know, if you are, uh, you know, I, I, if somebody gave me a bunch of resources now, I wouldn't even want. I, I really wouldn't. In other words, no, I want the process of earning my own way, my own things. If I if I start, you know, I've been around very wealthy people that have been given a lot of things. And there's a there's a lack of excitement and edginess and pride and and feeling of accomplishment of, of obtaining your own material comfort. It's like there's a joy in it. And so there's a there's a joy in process of uh, competent struggle. And so, you know, embrace that, and uh, and you know, you, you know, get, getting a big check from your parents to make your life easier, not the best gift. You know, one of the worst gifts that a parents could give a child. Yeah. All right. That's wonderful. All right. Well, so Dr. Lau, do you want to? Um, our first question was I had said is uh, somebody wanting to be productive, but <clears throat> reading competing things about being a stay-at-home mom and improving mental health for kids, how would you describe that question kind of as a general principle? How far off was I? Oh, no, I think you're right on target. You, you, you're, you're, you, you know where I'm coming from. You, you know the canon pretty well at this point. <laughs> All right. I love the discussion about the, the, the attachment theory. Oh uh, yeah. 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 That, that's a, that, that, that's a, that, that's a doomed theory and uh, it, it will eventually be buried by history. Wonderful. All right, Along Nathan. with the book right here. You got it. <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you. And we'll hopefully have a whole crew back in a couple of weeks. That sounds good. And, and we give our, our best to Dr. Hawk and, you know, hopefully she's okay. And we'll see her back here in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. All right, everybody. We'll see y'all soon. Have a good one. That's it. Bye-bye. Bye. That's it for this episode, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, this time with Dr. Hawk joining us once again. Please make sure to subscribe to our channel as it helps us out a ton. Have a good one, and we'll see you all next time.